I'm Adam Blair. I'm the executive editor of Retail Touchpoints. And uh, thanks for sticking it out for this long. <laughs> to steal from uh, Charles Dickens, in the payments arena, it's both the best of times and the worst of times. Despite some dire predictions, EMV is rolling out and rolling along at US retail locations. According to MasterCard, 1.2 million merchant locations allow the use of chip-enabled cards, and nearly 1 million local and regional merchants have turned on their terminals to accept chip card payments. 67% of MasterCard branded cards now have chips, which is a 51% increase in the number of chip-enabled cards since the liability shift took place on October 1, 2015. Overall, the Smart Payment Association's figures re reveal that over 2 billion smart payment cards were shipped globally in 2015, which is a 34% increase over the previous year. And in the U.S. alone, the association members report making 570 million smart payment card shipments, which was a two-fold increase over 2014's total. So why is it also the worst of times? Well, one set of problems is online. As EMV has tightened up security at physical points of sale, criminal activity has sought out more vulnerable points, namely online transactions. The Global Fraud Index shows that online fraud attacks have jumped 11% 11% since the shift. Much of this increase was predicted by payment industry experts who noted that EMV rollouts in other countries, including Canada, Australia, and the UK, led to online fraud increases of 80 to 100% in the three years following their shifts to EMV. Things are safer, but they're still confusing in brick and mortar stores. There's general agreement that the shift to EMV, which requires a dip rather than a swipe at the POS, uh, forces shoppers and forces shoppers to leave their cards in the terminal slot until the transaction is completed has slowed down checkout times. Both Visa and MasterCard recently introduced so solutions that will make EMV compatible transactions faster while still maintaining their security. But this has the potential to create even more confusion among both consumers and retailers. But enough with the doom and gloom. We're here to talk not just about the challenges in the payments industry, but also the possibilities and the benefits to retailers, including enhancements to customer loyalty and engagement, access to much more in-depth data about customer shopping patterns and their decision making, and eventually smoother and more streamlined payment options. And these are not pie in the sky science fiction. These are real world, real world solutions that are available now. So to explore these issues in some more depth, we have Eric Shea, to my far left, a partner in Kurt Salmon's digital practice with extensive experience delivering complex omni-channel, mobile, e-commerce, analytics, and systems integration projects for a range of brands and retailers. We also have Vib Prasad, SVP of Innovation, Global Acceptance, and Merchant Products from MasterCard, where he's responsible for enhancing the value that MasterCard delivers to merchants across solutions and services. He previously led their efforts around MasterPass, which is their digital commerce platform, and he has an extensive retail background as well, having held top e-commerce positions at 1-800-Flowers, Dwayne Reed, and Walgreens. So I'm going to join these very smart guys and let them carry this. Yep. Thanks, Bib. Absolutely. So uh, time to get out of the gloom and doom, right? So there's, uh, <laughs> there's, uh, there's brighter times ahead. Uh, you know, a couple of the observations we're seeing from a network perspective about what's happening in the payment space. It's a very exciting time. You have a lot of the larger digital players getting involved. Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon trying to be part of the payments ecosystem. But then you also see a lot of disruption. And it's one of the big trends we're seeing is around what we call the sublimation of payments. What does that mean? That means essentially payment becomes absorbed into the brand experience, right? The best example of that is Uber, right? So you don't think about the payment and it becomes something so seamless whereas you now rethink the entire experience of taking a taxi, right? So the yellow cab drives by, I'm gonna let it drive by because I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait actually for my Uber to show up because I don't have to deal with the expenses, I don't have to deal with the payment. It's just a much simpler experience. So I think we're gonna see that as a kind of an ongoing trend uh, and, and really use that to kind of transform how we think about our brand experiences at retail. Uh, you think about how our stores have been designed, whether in the physical world or the digital world, they're all designed around the payment experience being the last piece of the puzzle, right? And that's really where Uber has kind of really distinguished itself in that it is now just happens in the background. You're not sure whether it happens at the beginning or the end, but somehow payment seems to happen, right? So as payment fades into the background, that's going to lead to more disruptive and more compelling consumer experiences. The other piece is around globalization, right? We, we talk about it, but it's, uh, if we look at the actual trends related to cross-border e-commerce, right, all those Chinese, Tencent and Alipay consumers, 
right? There are over 680 million uh, Baidu wallet holders, right? Baidu being the, the Google of China. That is, uh, those customers want to come and shop at your stores and, and expect to have that experience. And today, that experience is usually pretty miserable. Uh, <laughs> and, and it due to not simply an effort as a retailer, there's so many other pieces in between that prevent that experience from really becoming uh, a great one, uh, like an Uber. The other part, the final piece, is just we'll see more and more disruption happening at the edges, whether it's a square enabling small businesses to be able to accept payment and accept uh, kind of cards or any other form of payment very easily. We're going to see more and more of that. So one of the things we've done at MasterCard is kind of turned our platform inside out so that developers can access our capabilities. And the, the same will need to happen in retail. How do, we, how do you make your location uh, API available to a developer so they can figure out how to build those innovative applications, right? Uh, you know, my former experience as a retailer says, I never have enough of those resources or the talent to do that type of innovation. By turning ourselves inside out, we allow others to kind of innovate on our platforms. And that's really, I think, a key theme for, for retailers to, uh, to, to think about. Now, a couple of numbers around uh, consumer connectivity. It, you know, we're seeing, obviously, internet usage was, is going to continue to explode. Uh, we're seeing the proliferation of mobile devices, uh, or devices in general, connected devices. Uh, it's going to go from 15 billion today to 50 billion, right? And that includes uh, you know, the, the IoT phenomenon, where, you're, where, where payment is going, to be, uh, is going to be embedded into so many of the other devices we have, whether it's wearables or whether it's inside a dress. Uh, that uh, the latest fashion designer is now integrating NFC chips into uh, into address, uh, and then finally the uh, you know the, the rise of of, uh, of mobile data traffic is going to continue to explode right as as uh, as we see more ubiquity in in Wi-Fi and connectivity, the better experiences are going to become more ubiquitous and people will have access to those. You know, and finally, as we look at specifically around payment, I, I think what, what we're seeing is. Uh, in about five years, we're, we're looking at about almost 20 to 30 percent of consumer payments happening on a on a device other than a card, right? And so that's going to be a significant trend, uh, whether it happens on a, on a browser, contactless, or in-app. Uh, it'll happen through a number of channels, uh, and really the the preservation of consumer choice is going to be the key to success for uh, the payments ecosystem as well as for for, for retailers. So that's a little bit about some of our perspective on the industry. Uh, Adam, you want to? Sure. Well, thank you for, for kind of setting the stage there on, on that. Um, you know, one thing before we go any further, I wanted to get the definitions out about uh, what we're talking about when we're talking about chip cards, contactless, and, and contactless forms of payment. Because there are, there are things that are contactless that, that are done with chip cards and the things right. are done with other devices. So can, can you guys lay out, you know, what, what the, what the terms really mean, and then I think we want to talk a little bit about some of the things that are happening now with contactless payments. Sure, sure. I'll, I'll grab that one. So uh, what, what we mean when we say chip card is probably what you all received in the mail in the last year or so. So this is the chip and signature or chip and pin in some other countries. Um, this allows you to securely make that transaction, and there's a one-time code that's generated uh, to secure that transaction. Uh, and that's the dip that you're doing you're probably now at a lot of the retailers. Uh, when we move to contactless, that's typically an NFC-enabled card um, where you're just making a simple tap to do payments. And I think that's been really interesting in the UK and Australia um, to make uh, purchases under, I think, 20 or 30 pounds. Um, it just takes a simple tap. Uh, and we're seeing somewhere in the order of 8 to 10% of all transactions in the UK using contactless and more like 15% in Australia. Uh, another interesting stat is that we're seeing folks that do have contactless, they're using them typically more than once a week. Uh, so it is really embedded into their, their purchase path. Uh, and then finally, when we talk about digital wallets, so that can be a combination of hardware, software, and applications that you might have on your phone. So that's an, an Apple Pay or the MasterPass type system. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that what the interesting thing we've seen is of, like, let's say, payments in a, in a country like Australia, which has really embraced contactless over 70% of MasterCard transactions are contactless. Wow. And so while we think about it's typically used for a low value, high frequency type of transactions, the most expensive transaction uh, in the world on contactless actually happened in Australia. A consumer purchased an $87,000 watch <laughs> with, with a contactless tap to pay. And, and, and so it, it just shows how once people get into a habit, 
that then transcends all, you know, all types of retail, right? It's not just at the grocery store, which is you know, a very, very high percentage of transactions, uh, but it's also gonna happen in, in, in luxury goods purchases as well. Mm. And, and I think, um, Eric, when we spoke uh, earlier for a different story, you were talking about that there's uh, other types of infrastructure besides retail that are set up to take contactless payments, and that, that can do what you're talking about in terms of uh, encouraging usage and, and changing habits. I think it's the London metro system. Is yeah, that right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, okay. and hopefully we'll have that here soon too. But yeah, I, I think there is a plan to do that with the New York City Transit system. There right? is. Yeah. yeah, I think 2018 or 2020. Which yeah. really means probably 2022. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, I think just anecdotally, if you're walking around London, you can see people making these transactions, and it's quick and easy. And it, if it becomes ubiquitous in your everyday life, where you're making, buying your coffee, getting on the, the metro, uh, just really reduces friction for the, the customer. Okay. Yeah. So uh, what are some other things that you're seeing that are, that are really innovative uh, t types of technology around payments? And, and I guess the, the other key question, which we talked about before we, uh, before we got up here was, and what's in it for the retailer? I mean, a lot of times payments are seen as, as you say, as sort of the, the necessary evil, the end point, or, or a cost center, and, and there's certainly legitimate questions or, or legitimate concerns about that, but um, what, what kinds of things are happening in terms of innovation? And this is for either of you, but either one. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the, the, you know, the interesting thing is how can you create those disruptive brand experiences, right? Mm -hmm. So when we think about payments, it's, it, I mean, if you think about payment by itself, it's not really broken, right? Of any part of the retail experience, it's the one that we all know is going to work, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to swipe and it's, or, or, but you know it's going to work, right? But how, but it, it serves as being a constraint in how you think about your brand experience. So we just recently partnered with a, a restaurant chain in, in London, kind of a fast, casual Asian restaurant chain called Wagamama. And they came to us and said, look, we've got a problem. We, we have people who come in and, and spend 50, you know, 57 minutes here for lunch but they spend 11 minutes of that time waiting for the bill. I said, okay, well that's not a great experience because that's costing me money, that's, that's real revenue. Uh, and, and, and on top of that, um, the customer's frustrated, right? So they came and they ate and they enjoyed a great meal and now they're, now they're waiting to pay the bill because it's lunchtime. And so uh, what we ended up doing was uh, you know, helping them kind of create a coalition of how they could integrate or innovate the, the entire brand experience. Uh, so we dropped in our, 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 our kind of innovation labs team, integrated with their POS, and essentially created an application where you walk in, you check in with the restaurant, you integrate with, with the Micros POS, and, and then now you actually have a, a linkage to their, uh, to their system. You can split the bill at the table. And you can, so I can, Adam, you can pay for your piece, I can pay for mine, Eric can mm -hmm. pay for his. Mm -hmm. And we walk out and we didn't wait for the bill. Mm. Right, and so you delighted the consumer, you transformed the entire experience of eating lunch, and you got them out faster so you can get more people into the restaurant. Right, those types of experiences are where you, where you can find the kind of the, the, the kind of the, the innovation opportunities. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and I think uh, it really is a huge opportunity for retailers, and I'm actually pretty excited about payments. Uh, I know probably not everyone is, because uh, <laughs> I think it, it does represent a, a change in the way we can think about the customer journeys. Uh, as Viv mentioned with Uber. You know, I didn't even know I had the problem of paying uh, in a taxi, but now I would never go back, right? Mm -hmm. It's just so easy and transparent. And I think there's a, a, an opportunity here to really transform every retailer in thinking about how payment uh, affects the customer. So as Vib mentioned, it's, it is not broken, it does work, but it is a restriction. So how in your business can you look at removing that payment, uh, th that transaction and making it seamless? So. I think another good example is Starbucks. Um, they do a great job of being able to take multiple types of payment, whether it's a swipe, an EMV now, uh, Apple Pay. Uh, they really allow you to do, do it whichever way. And I think that has then allowed them to do things like mobile ordering. So on my way to the coffee shop, I can put my order in, click, and when I arrive to the store, that coffee's ready for me. I don't have to wait in line, especially it gets busy in the afternoons um, after lunch. So I think there's really opportunity for that, and it's going to drive value for the retailers in terms of uh, loyalty and rewards and opening up new opportunities for that. Um, also personalization, if we can take payment back into our applications like someone like Walmart is doing uh, with Walmart Pay, we can better understand what the customer is doing, what they're buying, and allow them uh, a more personalized experience. 
So what, what's involved for a retailer to, to get that data that they need to, to do the personalization? And, I, and I'm struck uh, by what you were saying about Starbucks because my understanding was their payment system, uh, at least their own one, was a closed loop system. It is. So, uh, but, but obviously they take other forms of payment. Yeah. And, and the other news that we reported on recently was um, Kohl's linked up its Apple Pay at the point of sale with its private label right. loyalty card. So obviously that's, that's a, a closer integration. But in general, uh, is that an issue for retailers to be able to get the, the data that they might need or, the, or, or new types of data that they, that they haven't been able to get from uh, any kind of payment integration or payment, uh, payment uh, operation? You know, I think one of the great things about EMV is in addition to enabling payment, it enables you to embed loyalty information, embed all that into the chip card so you can create, you can pass all that information at point of sale much more easily, right? Mm. And, that, and that allows you to gather more information, be able to potentially push out offers, rewards, at the point of sale uh, more seamlessly without having to deploy an additional infrastructure around that. I think mm. that becomes uh, more compelling. It also gives you the opportunity to um, be able to analyze that data and, and be able to provide those insights back to the retailers. We, we have a significant practice around giving, kind of being able to provide insights using that data back to our retailers to figure out how they can understand how their consumers are, are interacting. And so as we get into EMV as well as uh, digital wallets, you're going to enable more of that intelligence to be able to be passed back to a retailer for that type of analysis and customization of the experience. Yeah, but I also think that it goes back to the, the brand experience and the full customer journey and what does that take organizationally to make that happen. It's a larger change than just payment. It involves all the, the different parts of your business from the, the marketing side to store operations to IT to build the infrastructure and get these pieces integrated so that you can then have these great brand experiences. So how are you going to store your customer data? How are you going to have quick access to that data? How are you going to link and de-anonymize that customer uh, with an opt-in? Uh, and then be able to then provide analytics that you can actually take action on. Mm -hmm. And that really is a full organization, uh, requires a full organization to do that. And, and traditionally, payments have, have stayed pretty focused on either, as my understanding is, store operations or possibly uh, financials or CFO, but they, they haven't been cross uh, across multiple departments, as, as far as I know. Is, is, that, is that right? Yeah, or? It, that's, a, that's a great point. I mean, at my time running e-commerce in, in, in retail, I never even talked about payments once for, you know, in, in my, this is about four or five years ago. And, and it, it ends up becoming a part of the cost center. So as a, as a, as a merchandiser or a marketer, I'm incented on top line growth and hit, hitting revenue much less so on, on payment. So payment became almost a, just a, a nuisance factor. Mm. Uh, but the way that we were able to kind of, so this was almost 10 years ago, I launched the first mobile app in 2007, right, when they launched the iPhone for 1-800-Flowers. And what was interesting there is the experience there, we were able to transform that because we had created this cross-functional team across customer service, marketing, mm. and, and you know, the, the lesson I took away from that is the best ideas come not from the executive sitting around the table, but the actual people talking to the consumers. Mm. Uh, and so creating that cross-functional team and empowering that team to come up with those ideas um, is, is going to lead to this kind of disruptive 10x type of growth rather than a 10% improvement where when the executives sit around, it's usually a 10% improvement type <laughs> of situation, which is uh, not compelling and not that interesting. Right. Right. Yeah, and I think uh, just going back to that, I mean, we are seeing a lot of retailers create these chief customer officers, or mm. sometimes it's a an omni-channel uh, director who can really spearhead these types of initiatives and really think about the customer journey and think about all the parts of the organization that it's going to impact. And uh, without that cross-functional team, I, I just don't think that's going to happen. Um, so there's still, I think, quite a bit of work to, to get there, uh, but people are starting to reorganize around those concepts. Yeah, so it, so it gets back to the customer, as some of the earlier speakers today identified, and also not just, uh, it, it sounds like what Ken Hughes was saying this morning about if you're just satisfying your customer, that's, that's level one. But, but it sounds like with payments, we're looking towards bring, bringing it further up the ladder so that, as you say, you don't even think about it with Uber anymore or, yeah. or, or whatever. It, it, it becomes becomes, a, a, in essence, a benefit or, or invisible, totally frictionless. Yeah, and I think uh, at Kurt Simon, when we engage with a customer, we do really look at, do you know who your customer is? How can we help you know your customer better? 
uh, from a segmentation and demographic perspective. Um, from there, do we know what the customer journey is? And I think a lot of people have taken a stab at understanding the customer journey, um, but have you done it recently? Because things are changing. Uh, you know, and we really do think that the customer journey is broader than just, hey, I'm on your website or I've come to your store. It's the full path from um, exploring your brand or understanding what you carry for products. I'm learning uh, about that product either online or from my friends to, yes, I'm in the store, maybe I'm on my application, and now I've purchased and now I've left the store. So the, the customer journey is a lot broader than I think some people think, um, and the, the demographics for the customers are definitely changing. Um, when we get to folks like millennials, uh, we know that their expectations have definitely changed around what a retail experience should be, and payment's obviously a key part of that. It should be fast and it should be easy. Again, going back to the Uber experience, it should just work. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and uh, I know there's some specific uh, things that, uh, you, well, we're not saying specifically that changing your payments will, will affect these, but the potential are things like um, reducing card abandonment, simplifying returns, and we've already talked about intelligence and analytics, as well as um, uh, loyalty and reward programs. It, can you guys go into a little bit of depth about, about some of those and maybe talk about how that might actually work, how, how changes in your payment technologies or payment systems might affect those? Because obviously those are important both in the store and online for, for any kind of omni-channel retailer. Um, how, how do retailers actually start to measure those benefits if they, if they happen? Yeah, I'll start off. Um, so I think first of all is, is the infrastructure to be able to, to get there, right? So you need to be able to measure first of all and have a baseline uh, before you can try and, and actually track these things. Mm -hmm. um, so it, in terms of growing the cart and growing the, the basket size, um, I think there's some interesting things there. How can we make sure that a customer who's walking into a store for an item doesn't have to wait in line? So can we make the payment method faster? Can we do things like line busting, uh, paying on your app or mobile point of sale? Um, or can we just make the, that entire experience easier? Um, that, so I think that's one piece from a, a payment uh, point of view. Mm -hmm. On returns, um, you know, there are other technologies like RFID, I think, that are really useful for that. Um, but we, again, we want to have a, a, a positive brand experience even when we need to make a return. So again, simplifying that return process and making it quicker so that we get that customer out of that mode of returning the product and maybe a negative experience back into actually shopping again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think the, the, the kind of the integration of you know, d different components, whether it's loyalty data into the mobile app is going to really enable us to be able to provide targeted offers. We enable through our platforms various types of offers and rewards and loyalty mm -hmm. to be embedded inside our wallets, inside of our various mobile apps to be able to, to power that experience. And so I think going back to the original theme around EMV, right, we, we talked about it as a necessary evil but what it really does is it opens the door on these entirely new brand experiences, right? Mm. So people will then be able to shop in-app, in-aisle. If we think about what are the key kind of tenets of what a, a payment, uh, you know, kind of a payment capability needs to deliver, it has to deliver convenience, security, as well as ubiquity, right? If, if you can't deliver on all three of those, it becomes something that, 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 that's a hassle, right? And so, you know, as we, as we started off, you know, we think about our MagStripe experience, that was super convenient. It was ubiquitous. It was it was secure, but apparently not secure enough, not, right? Not and so totally secure. And, and, so, and so what we saw there is as we migrated to EMV, we really kind of nailed it on getting it more secure, right? To your point, the fraudsters will go to then to the next weakest channel, but uh, we we then need to make that experience ubiquitous and and bring it back to the level of convenience that we had before. Mm. So the contact contactless experience, the in-app payments. The, the tap and pay with your digital device. You know, what we're seeing, you know, there's, there's a lot of news out there right now that says, well, potentially Apple Pay is on the decline and people aren't using it, right? When we look at across the ecosystem, whether it's, you know, we're looking across Apple Pay, uh, you know, Android Pay, Samsung Pay, any of, the, any of the pays that you're seeing kind of proliferate, we're seeing actually the usage is, is fairly consistent. People are, there are new consumers getting on board, but the average numbers of uh, transactions per, per token, right? Token is kind of the, the, the fancy word for secure payment on the, on the mobile device. Okay. Um, you know, we're seeing that really kind of, uh, kind of continue to grow. And so mm -hmm. people are enjoying that experience and they wanna do more of it. Uh, and they are willing to give up some, you know, they wanna be able to get 
the targeted offers and the, and the loyalty embedded in that experience because it just makes for a more satisfying overall experience. Right. Well, and, and you had mentioned it, it doesn't, people don't perceive it as broken, but I, but I think maybe a different way to think about it is if they start to see more benefits to it, they'll say, well, it wasn't broken, but this is better. This is better, right. This I think it's the, 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 you know, the Eric's point about the Uber experience. I didn't know it could be that good, so right. I'm just kind of embracing that now right. and, and rejecting the old experience, which was seemingly okay. <laughs> it, it, it's always struck me in, in writing about this, which I've done off and on over the last couple of years, is um, uh, it, it's had a little bit of a chicken and an egg thing issue with retailers going, well, if more, of my, if more of my customers are asking for it, then I'll think about it. Yeah. And the consumers, you know, going like, as you say, it, it doesn't seem to be broken exactly. Is there, uh, is there a magical tipping point area where, you know, enough consumers say, yes, I want to be using my phone for payments, or yes, I'm, I'm embracing mobile wallets? Um, uh, is there any specific point that, that any of your research has shown, like, this is where it'll start to really Move, move the needle in a, in a significant way? You know, so we have data from over 80 markets that have implemented EMV, and it really kind of, the, the tipping point that we kind of center around is when 60% of cards can, can interact with 60% of chip-enabled terminals, right? So okay. if you can get to that critical mass, and we're not quite there yet, uh, but we're getting there faster in the U.S. than we are in any other market, mm. uh, and so that's really been promising. So I think it's, it's coming. I think, the, I think people have to then kind of look beyond to what else can be done uh, you know, as part of that upgrade mm -hmm. uh, so that, that they can kind of get, get over the, kind of the short-term pain. And so you know, as we look at, as we have the staring contest with the, uh, you know, with the terminal there and it says, why is it taking so long? It, 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 you know, those experiences will, will, will continue to get better. I mean, we will, as you mentioned in your opening, we, up, you know, we will have an upgrade to our terminals as we always do, right? Mm -hmm. To provide more data as well as provide faster experiences uh, and, and as important, the industry, the kind of the, 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 the you know, the terminal manufacturers, the acquirer uh, part of the value chain needs to then also upgrade their experience as well, which is what makes it take so long. Yeah. Yeah, and I think we are getting there. I mean, obviously, retailers made a pretty huge investment for those who went with EMV. And so now we do have new terminals that can support new types of payments and technologies. So we, we are getting there. Um, not all of these the terminals have been turned on for those kind of things or been certified yet, uh, but I think we, we are ready to enable those type of mm -hmm. behaviors. Um, but on the other side, on the, the customer side, fragmentation is not going away. Mm. Um, I think we're going to have to live in that world for a while, and I think you'd probably agree. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, look, we are about consumer choice. We're, we are not going to force new Coke on top of old Coke. We're, it, it, <laughs> it, it's, it's gonna, you're going to have a mix of plastic and devices for the foreseeable future, uh, as well as chip cards and non-enabled cards. And so no matter which channel you choose, the experience has to work. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, it, you know, if, if consumers and merchants lose trust in that, then I think we don't really have a solution. And certainly no retailer wants to be in the position of not taking a payment version that, that a consumer wants to offer. So uh, is there ever a point where the retailer says, this this just isn't doesn't get doesn't seem like it has the support enough to to uh, invest in this um, or I'm not sure what the what question I want to ask with this but it, it, it we 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 were talking before about fragmentation yeah. and may, maybe you guys can do a little a little bit of being the teacher here um, there's many pieces to the payment process uh, the acquirers the card issuers the uh, the banks and financial institutions. Um, maybe, maybe just sort of like take us through uh, a, a little bit of some of the different things that need to happen. You've already talked about this a little bit, but maybe like who, who actually is involved and are, there, are the new players really shaking up the game or are they going to be shunted aside? Go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, if you look at it, the, the, the card networks are based on this four-party model, right? So you have card issuers that need to upgrade their cards to support chips as well as NFC for, for contactless, yep. as well as, as digital wallets. Uh, and, uh, and then you have got the acquirers that represent the merchants who've got, also got to upgrade the terminals. You have the terminal manufacturers themselves who also need to participate in that. Uh, and then you've got to get, uh, you know, at retail, the biggest challenge you, you always have is if you do this technology investment, there's a lot of investment in training that's required, right? So mm -hmm. I've been at many, you know, retail experiences where they say, no, 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 it doesn't work. And I boldly 
continue to tap, and, <laughs> and it does work, right? Uh, and, and so there's a, there's, there's a lot of education that needs to happen there as well. Mm. Uh, and then and finally, on top of that, it's convincing the consumer, because now you have this awkwardness, do I swipe, do I, you know, what do I do? And so mm -hmm. you, you've got that uh, kind of the education component as well. And, and of course, the consumer is going to ask, you know, what's in it for me? Because I, as a, as a consumer, I have zero liability on my, you know, on any card you know, payment that I make. Mm -hmm. um, but, the, you know, if we look at what drove, what drove retailers to want to, to do this was our fraud went up over almost $10 billion from 2014 to 2015, right? So while, while there's been increased fraud online, there's a huge amount of counterfe counterfeit fraud which in most markets we see drops anywhere from 70 to 90% of counterfeit fraud. Wow. Um, and so that, you know, while the numbers do go up online, they drop significantly in store. And so we have to remind ourselves, that's why we're doing this, right? right. And it, it's a very real cost uh, that, that, that retailers bear. And so it's, uh, it's worthy of consideration. Yeah. And, and when we're talking about fraud, we're talking about fraudulent payments, not necessarily a, a data breach of stealing of information or... Or does EMV protect a, a, in terms of like protecting people's personally identifiable information as well? Well, it, it, it does. I mean, if you, it, EMV and, and, and kind of the broader tokenization, right? Mm -hmm. What tokenization is, it's a fancy word for saying, here's your 16 digits. We'll just give you 16 different digits. And that will be the information that gets transmitted. So if anyone finds that or intercepts that or, or you know, is able to you know, breach that, they're able, there's nothing they can do with it, right? Because mm -hmm. until it then goes back to, uh, without the key, it's gobbled without the key, it's, essentially. It, it, yeah. it's mm -hmm. essentially it's it's rendered useless. Mm -hmm. And so yes, there is there there, there is value around uh, you know around the data breach uh, element. There is value from the transaction level, kind of counterfeit fraud, which is more prevalent mm. uh, as well. Yeah, yeah but I, I do think that most of these breaches are actually happening behind the scenes in data mm. centers and in other parts of the transaction. There are, uh, there have been cases where there have been things. You know, stuck in the middle of the point of, point of sale type uh, device, but I think in general it's more about the larger infrastructure. Uh, I think with EMV we're we're getting there in terms mm -hmm. of security, so, so it's a much much better uh, technology for yeah. security. Yeah. So. And um, well, you, I think you had mentioned at the beginning about the uh, uh, that with mobile payment technology, it's it's actually much further advanced in not non U.S. areas, uh, Asia and Europe. And, and uh, we're, you know, the U.S. has been the last to, to have EMV pretty much on a global basis. And, uh, you know, we, as you say, it's sort of a, we're, we're still playing catch up, even though we're yeah. such an enormous market here in the U.S. and North America. Yeah, but I think to pull it back, too, yeah. I mean, I think there's also a great opportunity, like we mentioned when we first mm -hmm. started, that um, we could potentially leapfrog some of these systems and move to digital wallets and applications um, sooner and pr get some of the benefits out of those. So. Okay. Uh, by allowing, by providing the customer value, uh, by using these systems and taking payment quickly and easily, uh, we can get them to opt in and tell us more about themselves mm. and de-anonymize that customer, which then can provide with the right systems a ton of value throughout the retail organization. If we know who you are, we know when you're in our store, we know what products you're interacting with and engaging with, uh, we can then personalize that experience on their application or in the store and provide uh, products and, and opportunities uh, personalized for them, um, and just really enhance the entire brand and customer journey. So. Yeah, I think and just to kind of fall onto that point, I think an, another area is to be able to enable these cross-border shoppers. People come from mm. other countries. This is going to be a huge opportunity. And by, by upgrading TNV and supporting digital wallets, we're going to enable a lot of that interoperability to actually happen much faster than if we didn't. Because uh, I think the, the the Chinese consumer is uh, is coming, if, if they're, <laughs> and, and they're coming in in large numbers as as, yeah. as they will. Okay. Yeah, we work with a number of large uh, flagship stores here in New York, and New York is a destination, and so we have a lot of international tourists coming to these stores, and I think that would obviously be a huge improvement for them. In that. Sure. Yeah, if, it, if it's if I mean if we're talking about globalization, but you trip on the trip as you're going over the finish line of payments. It's certainly not going to be a great experience for people. Yeah. Um, let, let's let's start to wrap things up a little bit and, and talk about you know if you were talking to a retailer now, what kinds of things? What are the maybe the top two or three things that you would talk to them about as they're thinking about payments and what needs to happen? Obviously, there's the you know the actual recommendations and the liability shift that's already taken place, but 
uh, on a more strategic or even tactical level, what kinds of things would they, should they be looking at and who within the organization, we, you touched on this a little bit already, but who within the organization should be part of these discussions as well? I mean, I think, I think you'll find we're probably fairly similar in our, in our approach here, but I, I think what you, know, what you have to do is saying, look, use this as an opportunity to rethink that entire brand experience, right? And, 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 and then put payment kind of in the appropriate place in that brand experience to make that work. Uh, you know, th that being said, you know, one of the cha biggest challenges I had as a retailer trying to drive this innovation is not having the talent and, and not having the kind of the resources, even if you did have the talent, to be able to go spend the time to do this. So it's important to create your, you know, is to create your village, <laughs> is, to, mm. is to create your dream team around payments, right? I remember we partnered with uh, UsableNet, I know one of our sponsors here today, um, 10 years ago to be able to drive kind of the, the kind of um, a mobile experience on, on our on our you know on our on our one hundred flowers site, mm -hmm. and so the idea is can you partner with different types of resources? So I think you want to partner with you know someone who knows a lot about the digital space, uh, someone who knows a lot about the technology, the in-store experience, mm -hmm. as well as you know who can help drive the innovation. You know, mm. you know we, have tri we have transformed MasterCard to be able to serve along many of those lines, but we, I think we've become part of an ingredient for a retailer to help drive this experience. And so thinking of that uh, requires kind of an executive level commitment uh, to be able to then create this cross-functional team, empowering that team to be able to go you know, drive this type of change. Is, uh, it, it's not easy, inside, especially inside more established retailers. Sure. Uh, and so I think that's, that's really the key uh, to, 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 to making the leap. So, uh, silos are the enemy, no matter no matter what you're talking about. That's right. how, how about you, Eric? What's your, yeah, I what's mean, your thought I'm on I'm definitely going to gonna echo a lot of what Viv just said. I mean, I think it, it is about the organization and do you have uh, a customer champion? Because it really is all, mm. all about the customer. And, you know, a lot of times folks think of it as each channel is separate and you have a leader in that channel. But when a customer touches that channel, they just think of it as your brand in, in your retail store. Um, so it's really important to have that uh, synchronized across the channels and, uh, and really be able to, to simplify using payments across the channels. So what does it mean on email to simplify payment? What does it mean on social? Can I buy on social? What does it mean when I'm in the store? Can you greet me now because you know who I am and that I'm in your store? Um, and I think it really requires an organizational change to make that happen. Um, on the technical side, obviously, there are a lot of uh, requirements there as well. So do you have all the data where you need it to be? Is it safe and secure? Can we access it in real time to then build these better brand experiences? Mm -hmm. So that there's a technical challenge as well. So there's a lot of, a lot of moving parts and a lot, of, a lot of pieces of the puzzle. Okay. I'm going to open it up for questions from the audience. If you'd like to take advantage of, like I said, some a couple of smart guys here who really know their stuff, um, we'd welcome some questions. Yes. So, so the question is about the net, the net impact of EMV if it brings down fraud in physical locations, but, but it balloons up in, in uh, uh, online or card not present transactions. Do you, do you have any, any data yeah, on I mean, that? It's, it's, a, it's a great question. I mean, so kind of what happened in Europe is a lot of the fraud migrated to the US, right? So that was <laughs> unfortunate, the unfortunate reality that what happened. <laughs> but but I, I think you know, what, you know, our vision here is you know, we have to secure all channels, right? And so we started off in securing the physical world. We have invested as much, if not more, resources in securing the digital world, which is one of the reasons we, I think, developed standards around tokenization. And, what, and really what helped us kind of catapult that into the mainstream was, was Apple Pay and, 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 and Android Pay, to be able to then make tokenization a standard that can be, that can be implemented everywhere. So then, then you've secured your physical as well as your digital channels. Um, but then beyond that, we have to continue to innovate, right? Because once we do that, then it'll continue to ratchet up. So what are we doing now? We're looking now at facial recognition. Mm. So we call that selfie pay, right? So you <laughs> could, your, your, your picture becomes your password, right? Because it's constantly about one-upping the, the, the fraudster. So, you know, we're talking, you know, we, we did a partnership with someone who measures the heart rate, right? Your, the heart rate is like a snowflake. It's unique to each one of us, right? And so we can then use that as another form of authentication. And generally speaking, when it comes to security and fraud, it's a layered approach. It's not just one that gives you the answer. It's multiple in combination, 
you know, and, and then kind of, kind of building upon that. So that's how we've tried to support retailers trying to navigate this because it is, it's very complex and there's almost, there's a sense that it's never going to end and uh, that's true, it's not. You're kind of always, always chasing it, but biometrics, that's an, that's an interesting aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. The question is about currency and cash and, and whether that's <laughs> going to still be a part of it or, or how retailers should be thinking about that. And, and we may have a certain prejudice yeah, here on, prejudice the, on the panel. Here, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> An anti-cash prejudice. So yeah, we, we, had, we had a good discussion at lunch and you know, our, our stance as a company is we, we've declared war on cash. Right? <laughs> we, we want to eliminate cash. We see that as, as, as you know, either it's, you know, there, there's, a, there's a high cost of handling cash and I think certainly it's, it's going to be part of what we do in the foreseeable future. Uh, but th then there's also the ability to kind of use that to be able to then, you know, how do we, how do we distribute cash? How do we manage that? It's, it's used for, you know, illicit activities in many cases. Uh, and so there's, there, there's a lot of costs associated with, with managing cash. Um, if we think about the, kind of the opportunity, 15% of the world's transactions are electronic, right? That's not, most of the world is using cash. So it's not going away anytime soon. And so we have to continue to optimize and improve that experience. But, uh, I think you'll see certain pockets in certain areas. I think you read in the press around, you know, Australia and Sweden saying we're going to get rid of cash. So I was just reading the other day that there's a bank in Sweden that says we've gotten rid of cash to reduce bank robberies. Well, that's convenient. So, but that's the place I expect to get cash. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so it's uh, you know it, it, it's a problem for everyone, and there's there's a high cost associated with with with, with managing it. Um, and so that that's something you know I think you have to kind of how can you minimize those costs. Yeah, I, I mean, we know right now that there's a proposal on the table to remove the 500 euro note. And again, going back to crime and, and uh, you know, using those for illicit transactions. But at the same time, there's also some privacy concerns around removing cash. Mm. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Interesting. Maybe all right, we'll, we'll use I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Maybe we'll all use Bitcoin. Well, that, that <laughs> seems to have its own set of problems. All right, well, listen, thank you so much, Vib and Eric. I really appreciate your, your sharing your insights on this. And uh, we're unfortunately out of ta time. So... Thanks, everybody. Uh, I hope you, uh, you know, there's no payment for this session. It's free. <laughs> it's, it's, it's all inclusive.